Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on machine perfusion of the liver. Where are we going? Uh, it's for me a great pleasure to be here. My name is Luciano De Carlis. I am a transplant surgeon working uh, as director of the Niguarda Transplant Center in Milano. And for me, a pleasure to, to chair this session because uh, I began in uh, uh, 2015 uh, with the DCT donor in Italy and was a very hard uh, uh, problem because we have 20, as you know, 20 minutes of cardiac arrest before the declaration that thought. So it was a great pleasure to be here to, uh, to chair this session with my film perfusion on uh, liver transplantation. Uh, I had the pleasure to co-moderate the webinar with uh, uh, Dr. S. Rayanna Van Rien, uh, who is working, uh, she's working at, at uh, Martini Hospital in Groningen, the Netherlands, uh, where she works as the Department of Surgery section of hepatobiliary and liver transplantation. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Carlis, for the kind introduction. Um, this webinar is one of the many activities that we have organized in preparation to the ESOT Congress of 2021, which will take place online and in person from August 29th to September 1st in Milan. This session today aims to provide our audience with the most updated information from the field of liver machine perfusion, as well as reflect on the challenges and the way forward. This webinar is uh, the first of many, is the first of, yes, okay. The first of many activities organized around one of the most exacting uh, topics in transplantation, machine perfusion. For this edition of the Congress, ESOT uh, has prepared uh, the whole machine perfusion track which will be composed from a series of webinars prior to the Congress, uh, as well as multiple sessions delivered during ESOT Congress in Milan. For those who will be present in Milan, wet lab session will be organized. I think we are ready to start. Yes, Professor De Calis, I think we are. And as you can see, we have uh, amazing speakers with us this afternoon. So before we start with the first talk, uh, I would like to encourage everybody to submit questions using our Q&A button in your Zoom screen. And you can post your question during the whole of the webinar. Um, after um, we have heard from all speakers, we will start with the Q&A session with everybody together. Um, and um, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Professor James uh, Guerrero from New Jersey, uh, USA. He is a chief uh, for the Division of Liver Transplantation and Hepatobiliary Surgery at Rutgers, uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical S School. And um, he was the first to perform um, hypothermic machine perfusion actually in patients in liver transplantation. So um, we're very excited to hear from him and also hoping to hear some uh, preliminary results from his um, latest uh, trial. So, uh, uh, Professor um, Guerrera, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Dr. James Guerrera from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in New Jersey in the United States. I'm uh, going to speak today about hypothermic perfusion of liver mechanisms, effects, and new frontiers. I'd like to thank the ESOT organizers and this uh, webinar panel to, for uh, this great invitation to come and speak. My disclosures are uh, shown on the slide. Uh, in brief, I've been a, a travel research uh, supported and also a paid consultant for organ recovery systems. I'm also the PI of the pilot multi-center uh, clinical trial using the LifePort liver transporter in the United States. So the supply chain is really the problem with the availability of liver allografts. And as the demand continues to exceed do donor organ availability, 
we've increasingly relied on marginal graphs such as ECD and DCD uh, type graphs. Allocation changes in the U.S. have also now warranted longer distances to be traveled to procure graphs in the United States, and that's had uh, some impact in the, uh, the average cold ischemia time for a typical liver transplant. Strategy to counteract this supply chain problem, really our expansion of the donor pool by um, using more aggressive marginal graphs, increased, increasing utilization of such graphs, uh, addressing the modifiable variables, and that's really going to be the focus of the talk, using machine perfusion to uh, improve liver preservation, and obviously living donation, which is a totally separate topic. So this slide just shows some of the basic mechanisms of liver preservation injury and a schematic, which uh, is really just to remind us that it's a complex uh, event with many uh, different, uh, different scenarios and pathways um, being acted. Obviously, uh, hypoxia leads to reactive oxygen species, uh, as well as uh, structural changes, mitochondrial injuries, um, injuries at the cellular level for both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. And after reperfusion, this leads to injuries that result in, uh, in, in graft dysfunction, which uh, obviously is a graded, uh, has a graded uh, degree, um, depending on how bad the injuries are. This can lead clinically to delayed graft function or early allograft dysfunction, even primary non-function in the most severe cases, and later on down the line, other complications um, such as biliary complications, most notably ischemic cholangiopathy or the non uh, the non anastomotic strictures, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail. So the current standard for organ preservation, I put a question mark here because this is really something that's uh, changing in this is in evolution, and that's the topic of this entire webinar, which is an amazing uh, progress uh, compared to when uh, I started working on this uh, topic. But static cold storage really has a, uh, a limitation before uh, irreversible injuries are sustained and the organ is non-viable. Obviously, it's simple and cheap, but lacks any organ type of organ support or any dynamic um, delivery of substrates and oxygen during the transport period also lacks the ability to monitor or, or test for any viability markers, which will be a topic that we'll further, um, further discuss uh, later on in the webinar. So hypothermic oxygenated machine perfusion is a dynamic preservation technique that's really shown great promise over the last several years. And we'll discuss um, very briefly some of the, the data to support uh, the use of hypothermic oxygenated perfusion for liver transplant. In, in brief, the decreasing metabolic demand um, with the hypothermic uh, environment, um, but yet adding a dynamic flow of flush out with dilution of toxins and waste products, also, also delivery of the oxygen and delivery of ATP uh, precursors, and yet still have the, some of that security of the hypothermic environment as a fail safe if there's any type of device failures. This was one of the earliest, uh, the earliest uh, series that described that uh, my group when I was at Columbia um, published back in 2009. And then there's really been since then a growing body of literature, both uh, in Europe and in the US. We subsequently followed up our uh, investigation with a uh, paper where uh, we per perfused and then transplanted uh, extended criteria DBD graphs that were rejected by uh, all other uh, organ procurement organizations, and we published uh, 30 cases of that. And, and then in tandem, the uh, Dukowski's group in Zurich was uh, studying uh, this intervention in DCD and with a, a more dynamic and continuous uh, oxygen source. And subsequently, um, their group published the largest comparison of the, the DCD versus DBD uh, cases um, in, in that similar time frame. Likewise, uh, groups in other countries, so the, the group in Groningen was also investigating uh, hypothermic perfusion for DCD. And most recently, the uh, first randomized clinical trial looking at uh, hypothermic liver perfusion for DCD was just published, and we'll show a couple of slides of that later uh, moving forward. So the current devices that are in play, uh, as you can see, here are um, the, the liver assist or organ assist device uh, the uh, life port transporter, which I will describe in our clinical trial. And then there's also a uh, Vita Smart uh, from Bridge to Life, which is a, a newer device that's um, in clinical trials uh, and being used 
um, both in Europe and the US as well. So potential uh, protective mechanisms of continuous ex vivo uh, hypothermic perfusion are, again, attenuation of inflammatory uh, cytokines, uh, increased energy stores by ATP recharging, reduced mitochondrial injuries, decreased reactive oxygen species, as described, and we have published and others have also published some uh, data showing how the livers that undergo perfusion are um, are protected by uh, reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Then application to more marginal graphs, as I described, uh, really has um, really piqued interest in adopting this uh, technique more widely, especially in uh, parts of the world where, where uh, aggressive use of DCD livers has not been fully realized and has tremendous potential for uh, solving this, this organ gap. And this is the paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, just came out really showing impressively in a, in a randomized trial with 160 patients uh, with 78 and 78 uh, in each group, showing decreased in non-anastomotic strictures for uh, to 6% in the D-HOPE group versus 18% in cold storage. Also, uh, four times fewer uh, treatments for strictures, even when there were strictures in the perfused group and only two retransplants in the control group for ischemic cholangiopathy. So this was really uh, obviously an important uh, landmark uh, paper um, in a nicely uh, randomized, uh, controlled fashion. Certainly there are ongoing trials uh, at this point. We have approximately 14 trials listed at, at uh, clinicaltrials.gov, and I'm sure there are others that are not listed on clinicaltrials.gov, and you can see they're widely um, why there's wide uh, variability into where these are taking place and uh, all throughout Europe and as well in the United States. Now, the trial that I'm the uh, principal investigator for is the pilot uh, randomized controlled trial using the LifePort uh, device, which uh, as of earlier this month, we've, uh, we've enrolled and transplanted uh, 139 patients. And you can see 73 cold storage controls and 66 uh, perfused uh, pay, uh, grafts that were transplanted. Mm -hmm. And you can see here, there's just the schematic. This is a totally um, portable device and the method of oxygenation is, is somewhat different than the stationary sort of back to base uh, devices. And you can see some schematics of um, how the, uh, the organ sits within the perfusion circuit and the oxygen tubing. The, as, I, as I mentioned, this is a totally portable device and Many of the cases enrolled in this trial where uh, the device was brought to the donor operating room and perfusion was initiated at the donor hospital and then transported um, either by, uh, by ambulance, by SUV, or by, uh, by a plane or combinations thereof. So the oxygenation pre-charge technique that we use in our protocol is, is a simple technique of, of actually uh, saturating the perfusate uh, to the point uh, where where um, there's adequate oxygen supply. And we've done some preclinical work um, just to demonstrate that, that getting the perfusate PO2 up to over 700 millimeters of mercury, um, that that provides oxygen, adequate oxygen in the, neck, in the early period of uh, HMP. And we did some work looking at the, the liver and how much oxygen is extracted, et cetera. So this allows us to have a fully portable device and not uh, have to have a continuous oxygen source, which is um, very difficult to uh, to retrofit machines um, and have them on uh, planes with uh, active oxygen uh, source, such as an oxygen tank. Now, and this is really the first time that we're actually reporting any of the uh, results from a substantial amount of the pilot trial. And you can see um, this was uh, this was not not all the patients, but this was uh, uh, one of our DSMB. Uh, data points, and you can see the groups are similar. Uh, the study cohort was a couple of years older on average and had a slightly higher donor risk index with also a slightly higher peak uh, the peak donor sodium and slightly higher MELD. And so far, we've seen a reduction in early allograft dysfunction, 7% reduction in early allograft dysfunction, and uh, but mo more interestingly, and no primary non-function to either group, but most interestingly, even the, the early allograft dysfunction cases that underwent perfusion were less severe and, and less clinically relevant as evidenced by 
the fact that within the study cohort, the, the hospital stay in those cases that had early allograft dysfunction was uh, significantly less, four to five days uh, less. So um, this was a marker that, that and shows us that early allograft dysfunction is not really a perfect marker of function. Hospital length of stay, um, again, uh, reduced um, and uh, amongst all comers by a day. So we're looking forward to the data analysis and it should be completed by the ESOP meeting in Milan um, coming in August and hope we, hopefully we'll be able to report that. We target to get FDA approval uh, in the second quarter of calendar year 22. And so far we will also have several centers that'll be using uh, the life port for continued access and that'll include my center um, for DCDs and non-randomized uh, trial using DCDs for underserved patients that are difficult to get transplanted based on our allocation system. This is also funded by an ASTS grant. And we're working with a couple of other centers, including University of Cincinnati, to look at further mechanistic studies, looking at biliary, biliary injury pathways. Now, just looking at our center, um, again, this is a relatively small number, but we actually at our center saw no early allograft dysfunction in our cases, um, which was significantly uh, reduced and also less uh, blood product utilization and length of stay sort of in line with the global results that I described. Also less uh, complications and post-operative adverse events um, at our single center. So new frontiers, I and mean, there'll be some work uh, spent uh, on this obviously during the uh, rest of the webinar, but solution choices, um, design improvements, therapeutic additives, uh, are areas that uh, deserve some attention and further research, further elucidation of the optimal protocol in terms of flow rate. Also, what is the minimum and maximum time and optimal length of perfusion? Some of these uh, concepts really have not been, been, been fully worked out or, um, or adjudicated. Uh, donor hospital initiation, a portable uh, system versus a back-to-base strategy, which is best, are there benefits or targets for either or both? Um, and um, so I think there's work to be done on that. Um, solution development, we use a solution uh, called Vasosol. Most uh, groups are using the standard Belzer's solution that's been developed for kidneys, but further development of, of liver-specific solutions also um, will be of interest. Standardization of pre-transplant viability markers, um, that will be, uh, Dr. Schlegel will talk about that in her upcoming presentation. Obviously, extended perfusion time to allow truly elective liver transplant. That'll be descri described by Professor Dukowski uh, in his presentation. And then combinations of techniques, hopefully, maybe uh, Professor's friend or Musain or Genofi will uh, comment on some of that. And so just not to steal anyone's thunder, we'll just kind of skip through. But there's obviously a lot being done in that, and I think we'll hear more about that. We're in our lab looking at uh, different chemokine expressions in perfusate and looking potentially to identify other biomarkers other than FMN, which is um, which will be talked about uh, later on and is of, of quite interest. Uh, other biomarkers in terms of biliary complications, uh, we're looking at biliary fluid glucose analysis and histologic and other biochemical evidence of biliary, in biliary injury and looking at immunohistochemistry of biliary uh, tissues after reperfusion, looking at uh, multiple um, biomarkers and uh, stains for various uh, regulatory cytokines and inflammatory signaling uh, uh, mediators. And we've seen that the oxygenated perfusion attenuates these inflammatory signaling pathways, reactive proliferation pathways, and also cellular uh, apoptosis and necroptosis. So in conclusion, hypothermic machine perfusion has really entered a renaissance period with intense interest in novel, promising results. The optimal temperature uh, protocol perfusate all areas of debate, and these questions are now being addressed in various clinical trials by different groups. Uh, further elucidation of injury protective mechanisms may facilitate further targeted interventions. Um, and really, this is uh, just a great technique that's showing uh, great promise and allowing more transplants for marginal donors uh, especially ECD and DCD type donors with, with better outcomes and fewer complications. Definitely like to acknowledge my entire team, which is a substantial uh, team, and uh, especially uh, Jerry Panetova, who's uh, my research lab fellow, uh, who's a surgical trainee, who's done a fantastic job in uh, most of this uh, translational research that I described. Once again, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the webinar. Thanks so much.
Thank you, James, for this excellent presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, I encourage uh, everyone to ask questions via the Q and the A, uh, so we can take uh, them at the end of the session uh, in order to save time to, uh, to, to, to have the discussion at the end of the session. Um, and now is for me a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, that is uh, Professor um, Peter Friend. He's a transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon. He's the, the director of the Oxford Transplant Center in the UK. Uh, he will um, speak uh, today about uh, the normal thermic uh, uh, perfusion, normal thermic perfusion of the liver, the recovery uh, from damage and delivery for uh, therapy. Thank you and uh, please, Rick, Peter. Thank you very much, Professor De Gales and uh, the organisers. A great pleasure to speak on the topic of normothermic liver perfusion, recovery from damage and delivery of therapy. Well, normothermic perfusion, of course, is more than just a better preservation system. Static cold storage works. It delivers preservation by stopping or slowing down deterioration in the donor organ by minimizing the effects of cold ischemia. Normothermic perfusion uh, achieves preservation by minimizing exposure to cold ischemia, but it also allows recovery from acute injury to the transplant, typically that uh, that occurs at the time of retrieval, such as hypoxia. And it also allows specific repair strategies of prior organ damage, for example, for steatosis. I'm going to speak just about the last two, recovery or repair and I'm going to branch briefly out away from the liver in some instances where I think some of the best evidence is coming from other organ types. So we have uh, what are the targets and what are the delivery systems which we should be considering? Well the, the targets are of course ischemia reperfusion injury. This is, this is the main target for anyone who's involved in, uh, in organ transplantation preservation. In the context of the liver steatosis is a major target. Uh, a bit further down the line, the alloimmune response, can we do something to reduce the risk of rejection? And also of some interest, can we do something to reduce the risk of microbial transmission? And what are the mechanisms, the delivery systems which we might have at our disposal? We could think about using drugs and their drug delivery may be enhanced by nanoparticles. We can think of cells. Uh, and extracellular vesicles, which are one means by which cells uh, talk to each other by delivering proteins and genetic material. And we can think about gene delivery. Well, the first statement is that ischemia, it, 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 in relation to ischemia reperfusion, is that normothermic machine perfusion is inherently protective uh, by comparison with the alternative. This publication from the King's Group compared livers preserved by normothermic machine perfusion all the way through from the time of retrieval and compared them to those stored conventionally with static cold storage. And what they reported was a clear difference in the two groups with the normothermic group demonstrating inhibition of pro-inflammatory genes, exp uh, increased expression of regeneration genes, reduced cellular infiltrates and reduced evidence of necrosis and apoptosis. So advantages simply from the fact of having been preserved by normothermic perfusion. There is evidence in the DCD of specific benefits. In this model, which came from Harvard some years ago, it's a pig DCD model. It demonstrated that ATP recovery uh, recovers to about 80% of its full level by about four hours of normothermic machine perfusion. And that that recovery is mirrored by markers of function and injury. So if you like, the DCD organ is a bit like the electric car that we're all thinking we ought to be buying, wondering about just what the range is and how long it will take to recharge. And there are some simple things which we can probably do to enhance the effect of normothermic perfusion. So this publication from, came from the group of Thomas Minor in Essen in Germany. And what he demonstrated in this rat liver reperfusion model was that a brief period of hyperthermia, that's a temperature of 42 degrees for a period of just 10 minutes in a normothermic perfusion model, resulted in increased expression of protective proteins, heat shock proteins, 
and that was associated with increased post reperfusion function, in this case shown as greater bile production. So let's move on now to drug delivery. We've known for some time, and this is a, a well cited publication from the group, uh, from the group in, in Harvard, um, of removal or, or mobilizing fat from the steatotic liver. This was a rat model of steatosis, and the investigators used three different drugs, a PPAR, visfatin, and forscolin, and demonstrated that within a clinically feasible time period, it was possible to mobilize a substantial proportion of the intrahepatic fat. We and other groups were work, uh, are working on this, and we're, we're working very much in parallel track with uh, colleagues in Birmingham, have demonstrated in this model of looking at discarded steatotic human livers. So those livers retrieved with the intention of transplantation, uh, shown to be steatotic and therefore declined. We've perfused these livers, either perfusion alone or perfusion with a lipid filter. That's the sort of filter which is used for treatment of patients with familial hyperlipidemia syndromes, or both of those two, uh, perfusion with the filter together with drug treatment, in this case using forscolin and L-carnitine and a low insulin, low glucose regime. And what we've demonstrated, and these are my, my colleagues, Carla Teresa and Leanne Hodgson, is that there is active removal of fat during perfusion. You can see that in the graphs, uh, particularly the graph on the right. You can see it in the uh, oil red uh, sections below, showing an appreciable reduction in fat content and actually much of the fat removal or fat, the, the fat clearance occurs within a, a relatively short time, so a clinically applicable uh, duration. I'm going to now step sideways into the kidney world. Uh, this is a recent publication from the group of Michael Nicholson and Greg Teachin working in Cambridge and Yale respectively and they're looking at DCD kidneys but it's relevant to the liver I, I'm sure. Uh, and they're looking at this issue of microvascular plugging. And these plugs are a combination of fibrinogen and, and red cells. And they are using normothermic perfusion as, a, as an opportunity to mobilize or, dis or, or, or dissolve, as it were, these micro thrombi using a combination of tissue of, of plasminogen and TPA uh, with significant effect in terms of renal blood flow, renal function, and uh, renal injury markers, although of course these were not transplanted organs, but they, they were discarded human organs. And the same group from Yale has demonstrated the potential benefit of using nanoparticles to help deliver drugs to endothelial cells. And what they've demonstrated is that the conjugation of anti CD31 antibody enhances targeting to endothelial cells during kidney normothermic machine perfusion and suggested that this may be a way of delivering quite high levels of drugs to endothelial cells which then act as a sort of depot uh, for drug delivery to the organ uh, thereafter. So now on to gene delivery. Well the first statement uh, is that the normothermic perfusion is a better way to deliver genes than cold. This is a publication from the group of Marcus Saltzner in Toronto uh, in a, this is a porcine normothermic liver perfusion model. And the, the oligonucleotide he was using was called miraversin, which, which is actually an antisense microRNA-122. It has the, uh, the effect of interfering with reinfection of liver cells with hepatitis C. Now that may not be so important now uh, with uh, antiviral agents being highly effective. And to some extent, it doesn't matter for the current discussion because what it does show, shown in the graph on the right, is just how much better the uptake is of the gene in the normothermic compared to the cold stored groups. That's, that's a potentially quite large advantage. I'm going to step uh, sideways in the other direction now to lung transplantation, staying however with Toronto, this time with uh, Shah Keshavi, uh, who demonstrated uh, really very elegantly in a lung transplant model in the pig uh, that the delivery of IL-10 gene um, during normothermic perfusion is effective. It's effective in decreasing tissue inflammation, shown on the right, and superior lung function, shown on the left, both at day seven postoperatively. So clear advantage in delivering these anti-inflammatory cytokine genes. So what are the potential gene therapy targets? And I say potential because most of these have not been tested 
in a transplant situation or, in normal, or, or rather not been tested in a normothermic perfusion situation. Not all of them have tested in a transplant situation. But there are numerous potential targets for gene silencing in, with relation to ischemia reperfusion. This was uh, one looking at um, short hairpin RNA targeting of interleukin-1 receptor-associated kinase 4, otherwise known as IRAC4, in this case during static cold storage. But in this model, there was clear biochemical and histological evidence of reduction in ischemia reperfusion. So one, can, one could imagine that in normothermic environment, uh, the effect may be enhanced. And again, this very, very um, tantalizing concept of being able to uh, deliver a gene to the liver, which reduces the ability of the liver to, to, to incite an immune response. Uh, so immunomodulation using CD40 or using ctla 4 ig uh, both of those have been reported by the group here of, of uh, Professor Todo and colleagues in Japan a long time ago. The concept being that blocking co-stimulatory pathways will lead to long-term graft acceptance. Very good evidence for this in a rat model. As far as I'm aware, nobody has done it yet in anything much larger. And finally, cell therapy in normothermic machine perfusion. There's lots of interest in cell therapy in, in many different areas of medicine, including transplantation, mesenchymal stem cells, regulatory T cells, dendritic cells. We're just at the beginning. Well, mesenchymal stem cells are a very interesting category. They come from either adipose tissue or from bone marrow. They release anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory and regenerative factors. But if they're given intravenously, they are trapped in the lungs, we believe. They do not end up in the organ we want them to end up in. There is still evidence in transplantation, by the way, that they are beneficial in terms of uh, kidney outcomes. A, a trial has been carried out. But the, the, the theory here is that if we were to give these during normothermic machine perfusion, this would allow the cells to become trapped or engrafted in the donor organ, where presumably the concentration of whatever it is they release would be more effective than if it was given systemically. And this is a, a very nice publication also in the kidney from the, uh, from the uh, Newcastle group. They were using pairs of discarded human kidneys, discarded largely, mostly I think, because uh, of a tumour had been discovered in the donor. Um, and they were using multipotent multi adult progenitor cells. They're not identical to mesenchymal stem cells, uh, but they are quite similar in many respects. Uh, and they're also commercially available. And they demonstrated reduction in injury markers, shown here as urine NGAL, and increased anti-inflammatory cytokines, shown here as IL-10, together with markers of improved perfusion in perfused kidneys, as, as I say, discarded human kidneys in pairs. So really quite well, very well matched controls. And finally, extracellular vesicles. Uh, uh, EVs or extracellular vesicles are one of the methods by which cells transmit information in the form of proteins or genes to each other and a, a lot of interest in using this as a way of delivering therapy to perfused organs. Uh, in this case, normothermic machine perfusion delivery of extracellular vesicles from human liver stem cells in a hypoxic rat liver model demonstrating substantial reduction in injury as, as denoted by the apoptosis index. So that was a nice publication from the group in Turin. So to conclude, normothermic machine perfusion achieves more than preservation. It achieves recovery essentially by normalizing physiology. It enables repair by delivery of organ-specific therapies. So designing these new therapeutic interventions is a major opportunity for us, but testing these will be a major challenge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Friend, for this excellent overview about uh, recovery from damage and potential therapies in the normothermic uh, perfusion of the liver. Many thank you. Uh, we will take your questions for your presentation later on. Um, the, our next uh, speaker for tonight is uh, Dr. Andrea Schlegel from uh, Florence, Italy. She is a transplant uh, and HPV surgeon currently working at the Caraghi University Hospital in Florence, Italy. And she has been um, 
participating in groundbreaking uh, research for many years, starting in Zurich and in Birmingham, and most recently now in uh, France. Um, she will give us insights into markers to predict liver viability and maybe test uh, those um, uh, potential therapies that uh, Professor Friend, just as the name uh, has uh, given an overview of. So, um, Dr. Schlegel, the floor is yours. Dear Ryan, dear organizers, thanks a lot, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to join this webinar. I will give a little bit an overview on viability testing. I have nothing to disclose. This is my layout. I will challenge us all a little bit and ask what is a good test? What do we need? And which par parameters do we actually use? And then I'll give a few examples and future perspectives in context of what we've heard before already. Uh, just an example, those livers I remember to have transplanted uh, in the last years, and we all know this, that's the situation, that's what you get offered, and you have older donors, as in this on the left side, the two cases, and you have young donors, and short or long warm ischemia time, and we all have a perception what risk is low and high. And those two on the left side, you will expect it did perfectly well, while the one we would say a young donor, short warm ischemia time, perfectly short cold storage implantation, uneventful, did the dreadful cholangiopathy in a very short time. And we certainly do not want a risk to be too high, but we definitely don't want uh, someone to get severe complications who is deemed to have a low risk. And that's the problem because we cannot estimate the metabolic situation just by looking at the livers. And that's the other consequence. We have a lower utilization rate. You look here, for example, a table summarized by James and Philip. You see US and, and the UK. And on the right side, um, there's the utilization rate if you calculate from the first donor offer to the implantation. And you see for DCD grafts, it's still quite poorly. And it will decrease further as it is expected in the upcoming years. Um, so what, what do we want from machine perfusion and also from a viability test? Of course, I'm a surgeon. I want it easy. I want it clear. I want it like an ampoule, so either perfuse longer or I want to know, no, you cannot use this organ or you're good to go. And I want it valid, so I want to filter out those grafts which, which will have a good specificity because I don't want to lose any liver below the threshold. And ideally, we want a test or a marker combination which is valid in all preservation techniques or, or approaches and in all organs. So that's a very difficult task. If we look shortly at the mechanism, you've heard a little bit about this from Peter Friend and James as well. There are three key problems. As soon as our tissue of all mammalian tissues get ischemic, you have a problem with succinate. And you see that here in the top, the red bars, this is a, just an excerpt of solid organs, brain, liver. It's very high, five-fold higher, 20-fold higher in liver, for example. And the reason is a dysfunctional respiration in our cells. So the mitochondria are to blame. They, they switch down their metabolism. We lose all the energy, even more during warm ischemia, but continuously, as Peter Friend said, also during cold ischemia, and we have an accumulation of NADH. And this is old. And there's a lot of impact points if you look at these journals where this was published. So this is new. And the problem is, as soon as this tissue gets now reoxygenated, the, the injury gets visible. And this is the problem because our mitochondria, they aim simply for getting rid of the succinate. So they switch on the metabolism and they want to get rid of the succinate and they do that quickly. And this is the problem why we developed and disorganized electron flow and radicals. And we need to slow down the succinate metabolism. And we have measured the ROS release. You can see that in that graph. And you see the, the black uh, squares or triangles and the black balls are, are livers, fatty livers in this case, which were reperfused warm directly. And then you have the blue curve where you see the reperfusion was cold. And you can measure the ROS. Radicals. Radicals are not easy to measure. You need a special perfusate with ferricytochrome and you need a superoxidismutase and then you have a relation. It's not easy. It's not a good test for viability, but experimentally you can do it. And you see that all reoxygenated tissues get rough a little bit or more. 
depends also on the injury we have before. And everything else also described by Peter Friend and all the inflammation we get is downstream. And we use everything downstream as a viability marker. And this is a nice review by the group from Cambridge. Chris Watson was involved here and Mike Murphy, the mitochondrial uh, biologist expert here. And there are two options. Basically, you stop or prevent the injury during ischemia. That's almost impossible at the moment because when you have a DCD organ, you have already warm ischemia in Italy, 20 minutes, as Professor De Carles just said initially. So this is very difficult. And also to block the ATP breakdown, very difficult. Or after reperfusion, we heard a little bit from Peter Friend already, we can try to scavenge the injury. But we need to be quick. You've seen the ROS are released in the first minutes. So we are usually too late. And machine perfusion is the, the target or the tool to change this. And you know this, you heard those two techniques. We have now randomized trials in both um, warm and cold ex situ perfusion. I will not go further into this, but we have tests we can use. We have surrogate markers which start already when you get the first phone call from your coordinator, you start already to analyze the risk in your mind. And then you get, when you use perfusion, you can measure basically everything. You can use the effluent, the perfusate, the bile, tissue, mitochondria, you can sample everything. But what do we want? We have quick tests, you see it here shortly, you can do blood gas analysis, biochemistry, and then you have specific tests. And the specific tests have a problem, they usually need time. So to measure succinate and ATP it takes time. To do a metabolomics, even longer, days, weeks. And so we want in the end a test which is surrogate for the specific one, so it's a surrogate for what happens in the cell, but it's quick to measure. So in, in a minute, in two minutes, or in, in 10 minutes, and real time. Now let's look what we have in the literature and what people have meticulously explored with, with normothermic perfusion mainly. Of course, we look at the perfusate, and you see the three main groups, the Birmingham group, Cambridge, and um, the Groningen group. And you can see we can look for measure pH, we can measure lactate, we can measure transaminases, as you see here in the middle. And every group has a little bit of a different threshold and a different time point. Bioproduction, of course, important. And you see the more livers you transplant, you have a little cohort and you lose a few graphs and then you change your parameters again. Time points, three hours, two hours, four hours. If I have a program, a young program, and I want to start DCD and I want to do viability assessment, I'm a little bit lost, it's a jungle. Then you have different timings for different markets. And on top of it, it's all fairly smallish case series. And all those, or most of them, have still a number of ischemic cholangiopathy. So it's not so easy for someone new in the field. And one problem or one reason is we do not look into the right compartment. You see the, the lactate is used frequently. It has this typical shape. You release initially, then, you, then it's cleared by the liver. And if it's an okayish organ, you expect not much risk. It's the, the curve remains low. But the problem is that lactate is a bit away. You see it here. It's in another compartment from the cell. It's not in the mitochondria. It's not in complex one or two. And even livers which have a low lactate and clear it quickly, they can be lost after transplantation. And the reason is that lactate is mainly metabolized in periportal hepatocytes, and they have oxygen for a much longer time than other parts of the liver. So they can still clear lactate while other ma main parts of the liver might have lost their function already and you lose the graft. And this is the other problem. We have three, four different thresholds published by different groups. So if I have a center and I want to start viability, what, what, which one shall I use? 1.7, 2.5, then all the groups have a little bit of a different perfusion technique. Not so easy. Professor uh, Watson has, for example, suggested a peak fall lactate, which makes for me perfectly sense, but that's only him. So it's not easy. And we should maybe relate it to the weight of the liver and the perfusate and correct um, the lactate slope or consider the lactate slope in contrast to just a single value, it's not so easy. And similar is it with bile parameters. We all know that bile parameters or bile biliary function depends on the hepatocyte and on the cholangiocyte. And the Vital paper is one of the perfect examples showing that, because just bile flow, which is the functional marker of hepatocyte um, situation, metabolism, does not 
prevent ischemic cholangiopathy. You need other markers. And um, Chris Watson's group and the Ronin group have explored this, and you can measure loads of things and put them in relation. But we are still talking about a small number of graphs. So we need more evidence. And another problem is where are these parameters come from? They are coming from our clinical situation. Look, we have a liver or we have an emergency patient on ICU, we measure lactate, we measure transaminases, and we know this from this field. And we have loads of apparatus and, and machines around this organ and the entire body. So what we really measure, those 500 functions a liver or a single organ prevents, that's not what we measure. If you have a list, I put a few, we know, what of those do we really measure on the machine? Not so many, if I'm honest. And the other problem is we are too peripheral. We measure lactate, bile, and so on, but we need to go to the root of the injury. And the root is in the mitochondria. And the evidence is out there for 40 years minimum. And what we can do and what many people or groups have done at all perfusion, perfusion temperatures is just take the perfusate and the tissue and run it through this very specific but difficult to interpret uh, analysis like metabolomics, for example. And then you can see which parameters are coming. And important, and you have heard it from James already, that from this pocket in complex one where the radicals come out in the first few minutes, there's also this flavine coming out, just one example. I'm sure there's more to find in mitochondria and it's not new again. So flavine mononucleotide is, is released immediately. When it reacts with oxygen, you can measure it uh, in the perfusate, it's out of fluorescent and it works at all temperatures. You can measure it Take the fluid, put it in the plate reader, and read it at a certain wavelength. It doesn't cost anything. One pound for the plate you need for the reader, and, and no agent and nothing else. And important, you can use it at any temperature. Here, just an example, warm perfusion, cold perfusion. You see how the relation is when you measure it in the perfusate. And this is another example. We published that last year. You have cold subnormal thermic and warm perfusion. And you see the higher the temperature, the more FMN, which is logical because the higher the temperature, the more rust release, the more FMN release, the more injury you have. And now the question I put initially is FMN a surrogate for, for these specific markers in the mitochondria. And you can do that, you can check it. Here is an example, you see the different columns and you see the green column is succinate. And during cold perfusion, we have a 180 fold reduction of this succinate. That marker we want to get rid of and we build ATP. And you can link this, you can link ATP with FMN in the mitochondria. You have a lot of ATP, you have a lot of FMN in mitochondria and subsequently a little bit of release of FMN only. And then of course, you know all this, we can link it with post-transplant outcomes and graft loss as you see here, INR for example, and it works in practice. We have established the criteria retrospectively and now we do it, Philip does it, others do it, prospectively in clinics. And you have two examples here, the, the favorable 51 year old liver on top and number two is an older Lee graph typical for Switzerland, for example, a bit longer warm ischemia time, not really much fat and you put it on the pump and you measure and you see what happens. Expectedly, the old one is good and the young one is shit. So interestingly, when FMN swims out of complex one, you can stain the pocket. So you can see it's gone. You see below the darker field, FMN is, has swum out into the perfusate and the graft is lost. And you can link that with the tissue concentration. So it's not, it's, it's coming actually from metabolomic or met metabolic uh, mm, mitochondria diseases, genetic diseases, this, this principle of staining. So it's not, it's not new, it's out there. We just need to look at it. And this, is, this slide is thanks to many colleagues from nine centers. We have measured uh, more than 600 perfusate samples with a mass spectrometer and validated FMN. So it's linked with graft loss in, in multi-center analysis and it's, it's practical. And now just an example you see here on top the plate reader. I'm sure you all have that in your lab and you can measure every five, 10, 30 minutes, whatever you want. And you can also read it online and on the right lower uh, graph, you can see different graphs which are um, release FMN and you can see, okay, 30 minutes, one hour, wherever you want to say that's my decision point. For us, it's in the first hour, we look at the incline and we look at the absolute level and you see every liver is different. It's like a fingerprint and you can 
rethink your allocation system if you are allowed to do that. And you can reallocate the graph. And this is a new review from the Groningen group and the Paolo Martins group as well. And they summarize nicely those variables. And they say FMN is developed in the cold. Yes, but you can use it in warm perfusion too. So you see here an example of a liver perfused normothermically. And you see the graph where FMN is red online, nicely increased steadily up to a certain point. The same you can do for kidneys. You see the incline in the first 10 minutes has reached the plateau. And then you need to decide, find out what is the clinical threshold to accept these organs. This is not new because the group from the UK has shown that before, that you can use it in other organs at other temperatures. Here, warm kidney perfusion, for example, and also NRP plasma samples confirmed retrospectively the decision made to accept livers or not. So, Basically, we have two strategies, countless parameters peripherally, loads of measure, measures and needing a, a computer and artificial intelligence, many hands to finally have the algorithm, which will need a lot of work and a high number of, of uh, experiments and also clinical cases from registries, ideally, or a few key parameters which need to be validated in other organs and other perfusion systems, but should work in all um, solid organs because biology is the same, essentially the cells function the same. Overall, we are just at the beginning, as uh, Peter Friend said just before, and there's a lot more to explore. And in summary, we can say we definitely need larger cohorts. And I'm, if I may say, due to this corona, we see each other more often on webinars, and I feel that we work much better together. We need to link the parameters with the risk, define better thresholds, and we also need a consensus that's just my suggestion to define what a viable or a reliable uh, viability marker should serve us, what, what characteristics should it have. And I'm sure in the future, new devices will integrate this technology. And mitochondria have not only the power in terms of ATP, they have also the power to decide for us and help us. And um, obviously, this is a long work for 10 years and even longer. And many, many people and colleagues worldwide have been involved, not only in these three beautiful places. Um, I'd like to thank all of them and you for your uh, attention and the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. As usual, an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I again encourage everyone to ask questions, but uh, with uh, via the Q and A. Uh, but we we will answer to this at the end of the session in order to to save time for the discussion. Uh, now, I, now I would like to invite um, to our virtual stage Professor Philip Dutowski. Uh, Dutowski is uh, the king of hope, as uh, he greatly contributed to the development of this technique. Uh, I have to say that thanks to his uh, study, we can uh, begin in, uh, in Italy, as I said, in uh, 2015 with, uh, with uh, this program. So uh, please, uh, he will uh, speak about the challenge uh, of prolonged perfusion. And he is uh, the, 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 the head of the uh, transplant, abdominal transplant program uh, in the, the University of Austin in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, Frank, please, uh, the floor is yours. Philip. Ah, thank you very much, <laughs> Professor De Carlis. Uh, it's my pleasure to say something here. I think my talk is difficult because the topic is prolonged perfusion, how far we will go. I think the answer is clear. We will go far. But uh, uh, I, I start with some ideas because there's not so much evidence how long we actually will perfuse in the future. So we can think about short perfusion hours or one week, or should we think in other dimensions, for example, machine perfusion for weeks, which will change a lot of things. When I prepared this talk, I was surprised uh, what has been done actually by pioneers, because you see here, Tom Starzer, he, he did nearly everything I think, but, uh, but he, he implanted also livers 30 years ago with 34 hours cold storage. So cold storage at that time was, was doing 
was was bound was was uh, beating the threshold of of 10 hours or 12 hours which we have now and clearly a lot of livers were implanted after 20 hours cold storage it, of course it was recognized relatively quickly that there's an increasing risk for retransplant uh, with increasing cold storage time but at that time also 30 years ago Another pioneer, which was Volker Belzer, was, was coming up with perfusion of livers, of course, not in humans, but in, in dogs for, for as far as, as, as 72 hours. And you see, there was uh, basically uh, no difference between these livers perfused for, for 72 hours compared to cold storage. But uh, I have to say the bilirubin increased after implantation. So there was, uh, was, were signs of injury. And uh, uh, at that time, it's just to mention, there was the same technique which we use today with the difference of higher pressure. So he was applying a kidney machine with cold oxygen and was successful in dog livers for up to 72 hours. So that, that's surprising. And if we even lo look back for, for more, for, for 80 years, we, we discovered that uh, Alexis Carroll was, was doing normal thermic perfusion even for up to three weeks. Of course, not livers, because they cannot sit in this gas chamber, but thyroids. And they were healthy. The gland remains alive during the whole period, which lasted from three to 21 days. So, so the idea is, is not new. It's, it's fascinating to keep organs alive out of the human body. And of course, the machines look different. You see the machines, the ECMO in donors and the NMP devices, which are on the market. I, I didn't put all of them, but I think some key players and, and the HOPE uh, devices or HMP devices, they all provide aerobic metabolism. They all increase nucleotides and they all allow to measure something during perfusion, which is now called biomarkers. And uh, I think, uh, this this illust illustrates uh, that we can and can go far above the now uh, existing um, thresholds of cold storage if we combine even cold storage with, for example, normal thermic perfusion or hypothermic perfusion. We can we can achieve longer viability of livers, as you see here in the publication of Chris Watson. And we we, we tried a different way, following Peter Friends suggestion um, to keep livers alive for one week that uh, that was that was it was necessary to, to change a lot of things to, to simulate better the human body actually we, we implemented dialysis also not a new idea it was formulated also 20 30 years ago that there's a need for removal of metabolic waste substances we we improved with the oxygenation we improved the nutrition we created new software and finally it was possible and i think it is possible to keep livers alive for even uh, one week uh, during normal thermic devices if the if the process of physiological perfusion is is optimized and that gives now a fascinating platform and I think we heard that also from Peter Friend. So we, we can start to think uh, about treatment of, of grafts on the machines and this is this is actually a difference to the hypothermic perfusion method. So we can we can for example try to inject cells cells in, in injured uh, parts of the liver like here like is, is here formulated in, in, in mice. So inju uh, mice livers were were injured by injecting toxic substances, and afterwards there were organo organoids injected and and uh, achieved an, a repair of the of bile ducts in mice, and that was repeated in human livers. Actually, in discarded human livers, not not many. It was only three livers, but but it's in a promising approach. So so by injection of uh, organoids or stem cells, you can probably achieve something like a repair during normal thermic perfusion. That's, that's interesting because that is a new, new thing which we can work on a platform for treatment. And the fascinating thing, even more fascinating for me at least, is to provide regeneration. So, so can, can we let livers grow? Small livers like you see here, partial human livers, can, can they regenerate 
uh, during normal thermic perfusion. And we, I think we made the first step. We perfused uh, partial human liver grafts also for one week. Actually, that was not easy. It, it needed not the same device. The device had to be adjusted for several significant steps. So filters, new filters, new oxygenators, new cannulas, new nutrition concept and new software. And that, then it was possible at the beginning not, but then it was possible to keep also partial livers alive and as you can see here, we are not at the stage of successful regeneration and let the small livers grow. But I think that's the first step to treat, to treat livers on normothermic devices. And what about hope now? Can, can we do something similar during hypothermic perfusion or, or different ways? How long can we perfuse in the cold? I think the hope concept is is, is different to the normal thermic uh, concept. It's, it is a kind of different thing. We we uh, we um, introduce that because it's it, 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 at least if it is applied and is chemically, there's no change in a procurement technique. There's no machine transport if you apply that after cold storage. Uh, we uh, suggested an easy technique, for example, perfusion just to the portal ring. That that would be the easiest thing. And you and you see that the the most uh, um, performed hope perfusion techniques, at, at least at, in our center, is, is now targeting two hours or four hours of perfusion, so not, no long perfusion. And we target here clearly on, a, as you heard from Andrea, on an avoidance or prevention of mitochondrial derived uh, reactive oxygen species and downstream danger proteins. So that's the mechanism. And that is highly successful for prevention of biliary injury, as you see here in the preluminal biliary glands and the deep biliary glands. They are, they are protected by, by, by uh, avoiding reactive oxygen species. And that is also working, working if you don't perfuse uh, additionally through the hepatic artery, just perform single hope perfusion. So that is shown and it explains the current uh, nice results from the Groningen group, which you see here. So there's, there's the first time a difference in the clinical, very important endpoint in DCD liver. So, so it, I think it, it will come in also in further studies that we have an effect on clinical relevant endpoints. But the question is, can we, can we pump also in the cold for a longer period and what happens? And I think there's not much data on the market. Again, the group on Holland uh, is here a pioneer, pioneering uh, the field. So, so they applied in pigs, uh, in the first step, um, a DCD pig, uh, cold perfusion for 24 hours. And, uh, and uh, the livers were, were reperfused for, for, for an additional period. And they repeated these experiments in human livers. And you see what happened. In contrast to many or some previous uh, publications, which suggest that we have sheer stress if we pump too long at 10 degrees or 4 degrees, there's no major loss if you pump uh, hypothermically for 24 hours, and there's no increased danger proteins if you do that carefully with a low pressure. In contrast to the previous shown results by Volker Dresser, who applied the high pressure, 18 millimeters Hg. So, so that is done with low pressure perfusion. And then, then obviously, uh, it is possible to perfuse uh, livers, also human livers, for up to one day without a negative point. In fact, with a positive effect, because there's a huge increase in ADP, which is also seen after three hours, but there's, there's no loss, no further loss of ATP if you prolong hope, for example, and there's a clear effect uh, in the biliary uh, tree. Uh, and uh, actually, those livers perfused for 24 hours, uh, they behaved like the viable livers, so the extended hope livers in blue, were uh, in, the, in the area of the uh, so-called viable uh, livers uh, in Robert's um, group. So, so that, was, that was a clear uh, demonstration that 24 hours uh, of hope is also no problem for livers. And that's, that's interesting because in the beginning, we thought the only effect is, is uh, um, conditioning of livers against 
mitochondrial ROS, but we can also perfuse a little bit longer by a pole oxygenated perfusion. And we repeated that in pigs, and you see, you can even prolong hypothermic oxygenated perfusion for some days. And uh, so this is only, uh, and that is achieved without endothelial activation. There's no transplant proof of these graphs at the moment. So the, the data, the data is, is, is not finished at the moment. But I think it is interesting that we have both options. And what about combinations? Because if both methods are successful, can we combine them? Is that even more attractive? It's true, especially in Italy, there's a combination of NRP cold storage and end ischemic hope. It's also possible to combine, of course, hope with NRP that is, has been shown by the Birmingham group. And uh, there's also in, in Groningen the application of hope and, and afterwards core, which is a kind of rewarming, slow rewarming and afterwards NMP. So that all this is feasible in the field. Uh, clear, if we go for a combined perfusion approach, you need to cannulate the livers, as you see here. So not only portaline, it is, it's becoming more difficult on the back table. And what we are doing here right now is if we have, for example, a liver, an old liver, DCD liver with some fat and, and giving high viability markers, which were illustrated by Andrea. Uh, if, if we are not sure if we can, should use these livers, so we, we perfuse them first, I hope, and put them afterwards on our normal thermic device for several hours or even days and measure again viability marker. And that's, that's, that's something which may be also attractive for the future. So I, I summarize, I think at the moment we are here. We have actually liver perfusion strategies. On the one uh, turn, we have a short-term hypothermic thing, which, which means not only one hour, two hours, it can also be prolonged for 24 hours. And that is a kind of hibernating livers with the aim to condition the livers, to, to load up ATP, to lower the succinate and protect clearly from ischemia reperfusion injury. And the other thing is, is a little bit different. So we go clearly for long-term uh, uh, treatment approach which means one day can, can be maybe also one week and that is we speak here about fully functional physiological livers and there we can probably treat livers for regeneration for defatting for maybe also for tumors anti-tumor treatment I don't know for infections so the field is here open and uh, in both methods we can predict function I would conclude I think at the moment, normal thermic perfusion and also hope both allow an extended perfusion for logistics, which means probably 12 to 24 hours. I think for logistics, there's not, not much more needed. The combinations of different perfusion techniques, it's very likely that we have here future advantages, which, which is probably a lot, as we heard from Peter Friend. And the, uh, the final goal of all of these treatments is the, is, is, uh, the conditioning of severely injured graft, and that will have a lot in utilization of livers which are not used today. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think uh, is uh, Rihanna is not uh, is not here. Uh, okay, I uh, I will go on by myself, <laughs> and uh, it maybe he has, she has uh, some uh, connecting problem. Uh, so thanks, uh, Philips, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I. Um, I introduce uh, the next uh, the next speaker, that is Paolo, this is my good friend, uh, Paolo Muizen, who is currently a director of the Pat Biliary Pancreatic Program, Biliary uh, Surgery Program at Carigi University Hospital in Florence. Uh, please, uh, uh, Paolo, please uh, begin your talk. Yes, uh, I will start uh, uh, by sharing 
the talk and uh, uh, I will uh, do it now. And, uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, please tell me if you can see it, otherwise I will, this should be correct. Uh, can you see it? It looks good, Paolo. It looks good. Thank you, thank you. I go on. Okay. So I thank you for the kind invitation of uh, discussing uh, the issue. I forgot the title, but it's machine diffusion, uh, the tendency of machine diffusion in Europe. And I'd like to start from uh, my favorite uh, topic, of course, uh, donors of the circulatory death. Uh, and this is a paper from the Council of Europe uh, that shows you the situation of DCD in Europe. I speak about DCD because uh, uh, DCD has been, uh, when we started in Europe, in the, at least for liver in the early 2000, uh, has been really the trigger uh, for machine perfusion as we realized that the static cold storage uh, was uh, definitely not enough uh, for the preservation of these uh, difficult livers. And DCD is practiced in 18 countries in Europe. Eight uh, have both uh, uncontrolled and controlled programs four only controlled, six only uncontrolled. But uh, what I want to stress is that uh, there, is a, there are a lot of differences uh, from country to country, uh, from the no touch period, that may be from five to 30 minutes, differences in ante and post-mortem intervention to use for control DC, DCDs, which are particularly relevant for a normothermic regional perfusion. The regulatory frameworks, procedures, and outcomes are all, are, are all slightly different. But uh, as you can see, DCD, it's uh, very important in Europe. The first four uh, countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, donors after uh, circulatory death uh, are all European and there are six in the first 10. And of course, Spain is at the top. Uh, Spain uh, have introduced uh, uh, control donation uh, slightly late, uh, but what they learned from category twos with normal thermic regional perfusion uh, made them uh, uh, put this same technology to work for uh, control DCDs. And uh, of course they increase the numbers uh, enormously. And uh, normal thermic regional perfusion, as you can see, is the use in Spain, has been also used in the UK, but with very different, uh, uh, with a very different approach, as you can see here, this is a, a, a DCD, one of the first one we did in, uh, in Birmingham and you have to bring the machine uh, to the hospital and uh, you have to cannulate the theater. Uh, it's a completely different DCD from the one that uh, the normal thermal regional perfusion that is done in Spain or the way it's been done in France, which has been a national uh, program uh, which was decided by the government or the way that is done in Italy, which has been a necessity uh, to uh, overcome the legal boundaries of uh, the no-touch period uh, that is very long. And you can see here two studies, one uh, uh, from uh, uh, Chris Watson uh, and Gabi Onisco, uh, the two UK centers that uh, exploited most of the NRP and uh, by the pan-Spanish uh, program uh, uh, of uh, uh, NRP published in uh, JHEP in 2019. And you can see the results are uh, similar as the uh, ischemic type B lesions are greatly reduced in the NRP treated uh, levers compared to the uh, statical storage. And uh, the UK has been uh, uh, really uh, very important in the birth of uh, machine perfusion. And may I say, Peter Friend, uh, has been responsible for this uh, as uh, he's been uh, in the, the, the really uh, uh, researcher that has really started the nomothermic uh, machine perfusion worldwide. And of course, the UK has become very greatly influenced by this and the many UK centers participated uh, to the um, uh, initial trials uh, and then to the uh, COPE trial, uh, which was a, a quite a large trial. Uh, and a successful trial with uh, a good uh, graft survival with less uh, early allograft dysfunction, but uh, equal biliary injuries. And then the VITAL trial, which was a Birmingham trial, uh, uh, multi-centric, uh, sorry, um, uh, a Birmingham trial, which uh, um, 
again show that you could uh, use uh, rivers that were discarded by other centers and uh, perfuse them with uh, uh, the Ogrox machine and then uh, uh, implant them. The results were good, but uh, of course there were uh, still some biliary uh, complications there. Uh, Switzerland and uh, uh, was involved in also this, uh, uh, there is a flag missing, but it's the UK flag uh, uh, with the flag from the Netherlands. Uh, there was uh, this, flag, this trial that uh, we did in 2015 with uh, Philip, uh, uh, looking at uh, the 25 hope treated DCDs versus uh, 50 uh, cold stored DCDs uh, from uh, both Rotterdam and Birmingham. And again, uh, it was clear that uh, hope uh, was, uh, had the edge in terms of uh, uh, reducing the complications and intrapatic cholangiopathy in particular. And you can see that from the graph very well. And uh, the uh, Swiss uh, uh, hope treated uh, cases were also compared to the DCDs uh, treated with NRP in France. And this was the first uh, large scale, scale multicentric study comparing these two different uh, preservation techniques. Uh, uh, they had similar tumor death sensor graft and patient survival rates. Uh, however, the graft utilization rate was uh, significantly higher with hope. Uh, we go to the Netherlands uh, again, and uh, this is a very important uh, study looking at uh, sequential D-HOPE, uh, so dual HOPE through the artery and portal vein, uh, rewarming, and uh, normal thermic machine perfusion. This was developed originally by Miner uh, in Germany and then uh, utilized uh, by Robert Porter uh, with, with the great thought that uh, the dope attenuate minimizes the biliary ischemic injury and normal thermic machine perfusion can test both hepatocellular and uh, cholangiocellular function. And as a matter of fact, there was only one case of ischemic cholangiopathy over 11 transplants. And a further trial, which is extremely important as well, uh, again from the Robert Porter group, uh, looking at uh, it's the DCD Hope, uh, the Dope uh, uh, D Hope DCD trial, looking at really the, uh, the effect of uh, D Hope on uh, in DCDs uh, and in biliary complications. And I can see the machine perfusion group with 6% uh, uh, ischemic or non anastomotic strictures performed so much better compared to the control group that had 18 uh, uh, is, is, uh, cases of non osteomotic strictures. Uh, this is uh, an equally important uh, trial, which uh, we're waiting its uh, publication on uh, the effect of uh, hope uh, of uh, human liver grafts in Zurich and 10 uh, European centers. Uh, as uh, with, uh, I was in Birmingham, I participated also in this study and is a randomized multicentric study on the effects of hypothermic uh, oxygenated perfusion on human liver grafts prior to liver transplantation. We move to Italy. Italy, uh, as you uh, have seen, has been kind of forced to uh, uh, make the strategy of machine perfusion more complex to deal with the legal restrictions of the uh, uh, standoff period that is uh, 20 minutes. And uh, this is um, an important trial with uh, 220 uh, participants. Uh, this is uh, uh, expanded criteria donors in liver transplantation and is from Bologna. But uh, the trial that interests me, although it was it's a slightly smaller, is the this Milan Pisa multicenter uh, trial looking at, uh, as I was saying earlier, the role of sequential NRP uh, followed by ex vivo machine perfusion. And it's really uh, uh, to look at uh, whether we should use a hypothermic machine perfusion or hope uh, uh, versus nomothermic machine perfusion to follow uh, NRP. And uh, in this, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, Luciano De Carles has been a pioneer as has been the first one to implement this kind of technique uh, of uh, NRP plus machine perfusion. Uh, moving to Germany, uh, Germany has looked both at uh, hypothermic versus normal thermic machine perfusion, uh, and this is a multi center trial. Uh, it's going to finish in 2024. Uh, it looks at, at HOPE versus NMP, um, of course, in DVDs because we're in Germany. And then uh, 
uh, this is also a trial on hope uh, uh, for uh, uh, extended criteria donors, uh, obviously DVD, and involves Prague, uh, so with the Czech Republic and three centers in uh, Germany. And this is just finished, uh, not, a, not a huge number of uh, cases, uh, but it's randomized and controlled and it's just been presented at ESA this year. Uh, this is a pretty standard trial, but it's, it's fairly big uh, on uh, the hope uh, on uh, uh, donors after brain death from uh, Poland. Uh, in France, uh, there is uh, this uh, hope uh, X, which is hope for extended criteria donors, which is being done in Lyon and seven uh, French centers. Uh, they look at the outcome, uh, primary outcome as EAD and DCDs are excluded uh, and is due to finish in 2023. But also they look at normothermic machine perfusion uh, in this uh, trial on uh, uh, steatotic livers, more than 30% steatotic uh, with exclusion of DCDs and it's been done in three centers in Paris, although it's a slightly smaller uh, trial. But the, uh, the game changer will really be a, a machine that is... The normothermic machine perfusion has been done uh, um, also looking at uh, uh, prolonging it for a longer period of time. Uh, in, uh, we're talking of uh, even a week and this has been done uh, in Zurich. And I wanted to conclude with this slide from a project of... Uh, uh, Andre Schlegel and uh, Dr. Van Rieven uh, from Rotterdam, looking at, uh, this is a benchmarking project in controlled DCD transplantation made by 11 centers and six North American centers. And apart from this, I just wanted to show you how compared to the benchmark low risk, uh, the NRP uh, with cold ischemia, NRP plus end ischemic hope, or cold ischemia plus uh, end ischemic hope and the high risk uh, uh, patients, they all perform better than the cold ischemia high risk uh, DCDs and therefore machine perfusion uh, does effectively improve uh, uh, graft survival. Uh, and I'd like to conclude that uh, uh, the same uh, heterogeneous regulation uh, that are present in Europe on DCDs uh, probably had an impact also on uh, the different ways uh, uh, the first uh, machine perfusion uh, project started uh, throughout Europe and certainly uh, some of them in the Netherlands, in the UK, have been influenced by the commercial technology that had developed in that country. NRP has been utilized in country with uh, large uh, uh, DCD programs, particularly Spain that had uh, an uncontrolled program first and could uh, transmit that uh, experience into the controlled donation and France, UK and Italy, of course, uh, and other countries are using NRP. And as you know, Italy, due to the long standoff period, DCD developed a combination of NRP and machine perfusion. And the combination technology uh, of cold perfusion, rewarming, and NMP has been a further strategy which has been proposed in Germany and the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. Very, very excellent presentation. Uh, so we move to the, the last uh, presentation of this session uh, is uh, from uh, Davide Ghilolfi, who is uh, an Italian surgeon working uh, in uh, the University of Pisa. He will uh, talk about a position paper uh, on liver transplant, on liver machine perfusion uh, that was uh, um, done after the, the auspices of uh, the Italian Society of Organ Transplantation. Please, David. Thank you. Um, hope you can see. Please let me know if you can see the presentation. Okay, can you see it? Looks good. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, good evening and thank you for, for this kind of invitation. I have no conflict of interest to declare. And I'm gonna talk on uh, about the uh, evidence-based position on uh, machine perfusion. Um, 
Why this uh, position paper are so important? Well, the importance is at least at three levels. First of all, clinician that makes multiple clinical decisions every day that should ideally based on rigorous evidence-based guidelines. Second, decision makers uh, who requires to synthetically know the real benefits and the cost of a, a new technology. And then for all stakeholders who need a clear framework when they are engaged as partners in the process and product of health research. So at least three society felt the need to uh, start working on a position paper. The first one was the ISTS uh, with a <clears throat> white paper published in the American Journal of Transplantation. And then uh, after an idea of Professor Ciro, the former president of the Italian Society, also the uh, uh, Italian Society for Organ Transplantation in 2019 started working on an evidence-based position paper. And then we, everybody knows that the ILTS uh, held a consensus conference at the beginning of 2020 uh, uh, about BCD and machine perfusion. Uh, the most important thing is to have a, a method who is able to assess the quality of evidence and the strength of recommendations. And grade is most likely the most important method which is used in healthcare. And it's based on two pillars. First of all, the, the needs for systematic review and meta-analysis as they can remove all biases and uh, interest. And on the other, uh, the other pillar is the, the capacity to recognize the useful research, which is extremely important for all stakeholders and decision makers. The great process is extremely uh, stratified and um, extremely um, detailed. First of all, it's quite important to have a multidisciplinary panel, which is able to involve as many stakeholders as possible. The second step is formulating question. And I think this is the most important part in a great process as it's quite important to formulate the question in the right way, selecting a target population, the intervention or the treatment of interest, a comparison group and selected the outcome. And it's quite important to uh, understand that the, the evaluation of the relative importance of, uh, of the outcome is, is a key point. Then it's quite important to have a summary of findings, avoiding repetition and overlapping data. And once this is done using commercially available programs such as Grade Pro, uh, the panel is able to proceed with grading the quality of the evidence from high to very low, evaluating the risk of biases, of inconsistencies, indirectness, and imprecision. Once all is done, the panel is ready to formulate a recommendation that can be eventually discussed and approved to, prevent, to, to, uh, to formulate the guidelines. Uh, as you can see from this picture, if the process of ranking the quality of evidence is pretty much straightforward, it should be uh, underlined that the strength of recommendation should not be seen only as a, under the clinician point of view in terms of outcome result, but should involve as many stakeholders as possible. And it's quite important to evaluate also the expectation of the patient and also the, the results in terms of the resources invested for some treatment uh, under the point of view of the policy makers. So what the Italian society has done uh, in order to elaborate a position paper on machine perfusion was to elaborate, it, to elaborate a three-step process. The first one was a strict grade process in which the multidisciplinary panel was able to formulate a recommendation and it took about one year of time. Uh, all recommendation was then re-evaluated and eventually approved using a Delphi method by an internal board. And then this external evaluation, this uh, recommendation was also evaluated by the external board, always using a Delphi board, which was composed by uh, international experts in the field. The question that we elaborated were mainly based on the three technologies that we were going to treat, basically uh, hypothermic machine perfusion, normothermic machine perfusion, and, norm, uh, and normothermic regional perfusion and sequential preservation. And we were going to investigate the 
uh, safety of this technology in terms of so technical failures in, or increase of rate of graft use, the outcomes in terms of graft and patient survival, early allograft dysfunction, development of ischemic type biliary lesion in the general population of patients and in the DCD, and also the capacity of this technology to evaluate, to, to evaluate the um, graft viability during the perfusion. Just quickly an overview how we selected the literature and how we rank the quality of the literature and then we move to the evaluation of the hypothermic machine perfusion. So when we evaluated the, the safety of this technology, uh, I have to say that at the time we were writing the paper, there were no cases of technical failure. So the recommendation of the society was uh, that this technology was a, a safe organ preservation technique. Uh, in terms of uh, increased organ uh, utilization, well, we have to say that there were at least two paper uh, that reported the use of organ grafts uh, even after prolonged preservation time. So the suggestion of the society was that hypothermic machine perfusion could be considered a useful tool to increase donor pool, improve transplant logistics, and prolong excited time uh, duration. This is one of the tables we had to evaluate it when all, all the data was extracted from uh, the literature. As you can see, something is quite important. There were no randomized perspective trial and there are a lot of empty spaces. That mean, means that also in the transplant community, there is no uh, a certain agreement of the, which are the primary outcome, the most important outcome to be evaluated and how to design a study. So uh, the question if the hypothermic machine perfusion was able to improve the results in terms of graft and patient survival, I have to report that four patients reported that one year graft survival significantly improved when the, hypo in a, when the hypothermic uh, machine perfusion uh, were adopted. Nevertheless, the effect of this hypothermic machine perfusion of graft survival will observe only in extended criteria graft which meaning uh, DCD or moderate to severe microscopy. So the suggestion was to use hypothermic machine perfusion for the improvement of graft survival, especially in the setting of extended criteria donor. A uh, few months after the, the publication of our uh, manuscript, a systematic review and meta-analysis was published. And to be honest, the, the result was completely different, even if not statistically significant. Uh, the meta-analysis showed that there was no major difference among machine perfusion or cold storage. But this is a, a, a nice example of inconsistency, meaning uh, of weakness of, uh, um, the, of literature report when a, a new technology is adopted. It was enough not to introduce one or two paper to change and modify completely the results of our analysis. In terms of early graph, allograft dysfunction, the result was pretty much clear. EAD was statistically reduced in two case control studies over four, and in two other experience, EAD was higher, even if not statistical significant. Uh, even the uh, meta-analysis confirm our results, so we could suggest the use of hypothermic machine perfusion in order to reduce post-transplant early allograft dysfunction. Nevertheless, the, the panel uh, was prone to suggest the adoption of a standardized definition of early graft dysfunction, which were more um, close to um, clinical results. In terms of ischemic type biliary lesion, 11 papers reported the incidence of ischemic cholangiopathy, and in nine cases, they had a control group composed by, by graft uh, conserved in, in, in the eyes. The results of the incidence of ischemic type biliary lesion was extremely heterogeneous, but always in the same direction. The meta-analysis also confirmed our findings and it was statistically significant. And though in, it's quite clear that hypothermic machine perfusion was able to reduce post-transplant ischemic type biliary lesion, especially in extended criteria donors or DCT donors. But even though we uh, suggested to adopt a standardized surveillance protocol and definition for ischemic type biliary lesion. Um, I have to say that recently uh, a new paper well designed and also <clears throat> well powered 
show that actually, even if there was no difference in terms of graft and patient survival, uh, no hypothermic machine perfusion was able to prevent uh, the uh, ischemic cholangiopathy in DCD graft when these were treated with hypothermic machine perfusion. There is a, a, an aspect that we should, uh, that we were not able to find any major difference. This is the capacity of hypothermic machine perfusion in evaluating graft viability. At the moment, we could recognize that there is no acceptable criteria to to evaluate the graph viability during, during the machine perfusion. Moving to normal thermic machine perfusion, the first uh, topic that we want to evaluate was safety. And in literature, there were seven out of about 300 cases of machine perfusion reporting technical issue determining graph loss or requiring a prompt switch to static cold storage. Uh, even though the, the panel uh, suggested to consider normal thermic machine perfusion as a safe procedure for organ preservation as long as the whole process uh, was supervised by the transplant surgeon with experience in organ retrieval, vascular reconstruction, and with a specific NMP training. The, the topic in which normal thermic machine perfusion show is uh, uh, power and um, he, he, and, and the, the potentiality of this technology was, of course, the, the capacity of recruit new organs and evaluate graft during the perfusion. In, in terms of graft in, uh, utilization, there are several, several experience. I just reported one of the last showing that uh, uh, normal thermal machine perfusion is able to improve the gut feeling of the surgeon to, to use an organ. And the recommendation of the panel was that NMP is a useful tool that could implement the use of ECD graph based on its potential to enable graph function evaluation, improve transplant logistics, and prolong ex vivo time duration. Again, this is the panel. As you can see, there were uh, evaluating outcomes. There were only two randomized controlled study evaluating the outcome, and also the, 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 the outcome were evaluated at six months or one year, meaning that there was a major differences among centers. Uh, what's the impact in terms of graft and patient survival? Basically, considering only the randomized control trial, there were no differences in terms of graft uh, or patient survival. And so at the moment, we could say that NMP did not show differences with respect to status called storage in terms of patient or graft survival in the selected population so far investigated. The suggestion was to reconsider a possible future utilization benefit in specific donor or recipient to population like extended criteria dogs. The decision was much easier in early allograft dysfunction where all the, the cases were supporting the use of uh, NMP uh, and the results were statistically significant. In terms of biliary lesion, instead, both the randomized control cases and the case control didn't show major differences. The meta-analysis supported our analysis. There was no major differences or statistical differences in terms of uh, incidence of ischemic cholangiopathy using the machine perfusion or the statistical storage. So at the moment, the, the recommendation of the panel was that the NMP, that I mean, the, the use of NMP for the reduction of post-transplant ischemic biliary lesion was not supported by the evidence available in literature. Definitely, uh, as, as we said before, NMP has a great, as a relevant potentiality for graph viability assessment. We evaluated several parameters like perfusate pH, lactate clearance, absolute lactate value by production, and so on. But at the moment, no definitely uh, parameters was assessed, was uh, definitely assessed during normal term machine perfusion as strictly correlated to organ viability. But there are several, several ongoing uh, studies and uh, uh, reported experience uh, with promising results showing that NMP has a great potentiality in improving the, the number of uh, graft used, especially of or already discarded graft, even if biliary complication uh, incidence remain quite high. I'm going to go very quickly on the use of normal therapy regional perfusion. Uh, as we said before, in Italy, we have been obliged, it was uh, mandatory and we were obliged to use NLP 
in order to start using PCD grafts. There are only two studies comparing NRP uh, to rapid uh, retrieval technique. And NRP was associated with lower PNF, early allograft dysfunction, improved early allograft dysfunction, reduces chemotype biliary lesion. So the suggestion of the panel was to, that NRP was a, a tool with the potential to improve outcome when DCD graph was used. We try also to evaluate the impact of the sequential use of NRP and excitoperfusion, but there were no sufficient data. I just want to underline this uh, report from, is a multi-center study written by the group of the Carlis, showing that uh, uh, the sequential use compared of, uh, the sequential use of NRP and excitoperfusion compared to uh, DCD, uh, similar DCD uh, donors performed in UK may have comparable or even better results. Uh, let me conclude with a couple of uh, slides. The first one is position profile has several weeks, especially at the beginning of the introduction of a new technology. First of all, they are extremely dynamic. And so a need for a scheduled re-evaluation should be uh, considered at least every three, three years. There's a strong need for systematic review and meta-analysis because they may allow to avoid an excessive dependence from expert opinion, which are potentially exposed to severe conflict of interest. And the other thing we should not think that the, the, only the involvement of physician is, is enough. Uh, we should involve uh, as many stakeholders as possible because there is no an absolute meaning of efficacy, but it's always in relation to expectation. What we can do now to improve and uh, to be prepared for the next position paper. First of all, as a transplant community, try to standardize nomenclature in order to allow comparison and meta-analysis and try to design our study uh, in order to prefer randomized trial um, to support adequately, adequately power the study, uh, to evaluate proper endpoint, uh, in particular primary endpoint with a hard clinical outcome instead of surrogate laboratory endpoints. Uh, again, I want to underline the importance of a proper time of randomization, especially based on the primary outcome that we want to reach. And always, always when a new technology is evaluated, uh, evaluate the intention to treat analysis. I thank you very much for your attention and the whole group that worked on, on this manuscript. Thank you very much, David. Very, very nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have no time for discussion because we are very late. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, is isn't the, isn't not possible because we have 15 minutes late from the scheduling. So I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for the very interesting uh, talks this afternoon. Um, we would like to uh, uh, ask participants to answer a quick, a quick poll. that will soon appear on the screen. Please take a few seconds to let us know what uh, you thought. Okay, this is the result. I think that 63% uh, of people said that it was extremely useful and useful uh, in 33%. Uh, uh, I think uh, we can be very, very satisfied for these results. And uh, we thanks again, uh, the speaker. Thanks to the speaker if uh, this uh, webinar was uh, this, uh, as, as this, uh, uh, success. ISOT has prepared more exciting webinars in the coming weeks, so please make sure to register on the Congress website. Uh, this is uh, other uh, arguments that can be of interest for everyone. And uh, we hope uh, to see you all in Milan at the end of August. 
uh, we have this congress uh, at uh, least in, in presence with uh, we, we can be uh, together with the congress after this uh, period of pandemia and uh, we encourage you to register to the congress uh, thank you for Rihanna for doing this webinar with me but uh, she has uh, some problem of connection and now uh, is not with uh, is not with us thank you very much Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>